Welcome to Digital Asset News, take the top stories in cryptocurrency digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, we've got some really interesting stuff. First up, this is CEO of MicroStrategy, Michael Saylor, and he's going to tell us not only exactly why he got into Bitcoin, but why gold is far inferior to Bitcoin, what's going to happen in 5 to 10 years, price predictions, and overall just why he made this enormous decision. So this is going to be a great video for anybody that you talk to about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and digital assets, especially the gold bugs, because his argument crushes everything they say. Also, good news, bad news for Ethereum. The top Buterin updates the Ethereum 2.0 roadmap. Details plan to exponentially increase scalability. And what he's talking about here is going from 15 transactions per second, which is absolutely nothing, all the way up to a potential 100,000 TPS using a thing called rollups. And good news, KuCoin Crypto Exchange alleges to have found Ethereum hackers, which is really not the big story. The big story is, is why were supposedly some decentralized projects able to stop, potentially reverse, as opposed to other projects like Ethereum, which which were not able to be blacklisted. And finally, SEC Chairman Jay Clayton backs the innovation in crypto, but warns of tricky play. And this is always an interesting topic. I've been in the game since 2017. Some of you have been here for a lot longer, and we've all heard the same song and dance. The, a the ETF is right around the corner. Well, this could actually be it, but I will just tell you right now, don't hold your, don't hold your breath. First, let's jump into what's going on in today's market. So today, it is Saturday, October 3rd, and just so you know, I tried to do a live stream and totally failed on uh, the Digital Asset News uh, channel, but I was able to do a live stream over at Digital Asset News Clips. So everything we're gonna talk about here, we did a live stream over there. Uh, if you can go check that out. I created Dan Clips uh, for two reasons. One is because sometimes I go a little bit too long on these videos, like 30, 40 minutes. So I wanna break down all the clips. So instead of having 40 minutes, you can just watch clips of three to five, maybe seven minutes. And the second reason was is because I don't want YouTube to shut me down and go, hey, great job, and I'll get out of here. So I have that as a backup. And also we do exclusive videos over there. So check it out when you got time digital asset news clips but here's what's happening with the market so this was actually a great day considering what is going on so we had the bitmex scandal uh, where the CFTC came down and said, hey, uh, you guys aren't doing the right things. You are violating the Anti-Money Laundering Act and you've opened up an exchange without getting proper approval and we don't like that. So there are some problems there. And on top of that, we had tens of thousands, I think maybe hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin uh, that were siphoned out of BitMEX, not by hackers, just by people who said, hey, I want to deal with this. So I'm going to take my Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies out of here now before the CFTC comes down and does who knows knows what. I don't know if that's going to happen, but uh, uh, I always err on the side of caution. So I can see why people definitely do that. So we had that part. And then also uh, the second part, President of the United States came down with the coronavirus. So we thought that there would be a huge tumble, but uh, hey, here we are. Bitcoin's up 0.3%. I like to see that. And Ethereum, 2% hitting my threshold of 350. Great job, Ethereum. Tether's Tether, XRP. I I think as far as stable coins, I know I know Tether is uh, tethered to the US dollar. I think XRP is tethered to the quarter because it's always around 25 cents. Binance coin uh, up 3.7, $28 and in that fifth spot. So congratulations to all your Binance coin holders. I do not, but hey, I'm a big cheerleader for everything that's cryptocurrency, so congratulations. Bitcoin Cash up 1%, Polkadot half, Chainlink up uh, 3.2, but still below that $10. What are you gonna do? Litecoin, crypto, everything's up. It's a pretty good day. Geez, 10.6% for Tron. I don't know why that is, but uh, maybe someone can enlighten me in the comment section. Also, big news. Wow, Theta Network's in the top 30. Look at that, 10.5%. And uh, I was on Alex Maschioli's show yesterday, and uh, we've, they've, got a lot of, they've got a couple of really smart guys over there, some TA people from uh, Market Rebellion, and they've actually called a lot of good good calls that I thought they were like full of it, but they actually, they, I remember one was Monty. He said, yeah, Chainlink's going to go to below 10. I'm like, you're full of it. And hey, here we are. But uh, I got a chance to tell him about Theta and just talk about, you know, how great I think it's going to be and uh, where it actually is going. And uh, yeah, I mean, I see big things for Theta. It's one of my, one of my new holds and uh, so far so good. Also on top of new holds, Uniswap, of course, I got to have it free just like everybody else, but I do believe in the project. I like how they did the airdrop to the community, not to whales, so looking pretty good. Ave up 5.6, Synthetics up 2.4, Uma, UMA, 4.93. Anything fantastic? Wow, Celsius Network making it, a, just crushing it. 30% up for the week, 
13% 24 hours, $1.21. I remember when it was like 75, you know, 50 cents. And here we are. So take a look at Celsius. If you don't know, Celsius is one of my, uh, I have 30% of my entire portfolio in the Celsius network. Not in Celsius itself, just in the wallet. Uh, I believe in it, it's a great project and you get uh, really good interest. Now there's other places that might give you more interest, but I trust it. So uh, it, I'm allowed to uh, sleep soundly at night. Just saying. All right, so let's jump into today's top story. So first up, um, I've already prefaced this. I think this is huge. I like where Michael Saylor is going. So let's just jump in. So this, as a recap, uh, MicroStrategy is a billion dollar company, one of those Silicon Valley places, a data and analytics firm. And Saylor said, hey, he had like around $500 million. He goes, I'm sitting on a melting ice cube, essentially because of the quantitative easing, the money printing, and the uh, amazingly amount of inflation. So I'm going to put in a Bitcoin. And he's not a dumb guy. I think this guy, I believe he went, I'm pretty sure he went to MIT. Uh, he started his company at 20 24, uh, made into a billion dollar company. And uh, he's done a lot of research. And he said of all the different assets, uh, Bitcoin was the one and he was going to go into, into gold, but he explains why. And I think this is important for everybody to listen to as a, as a, because of what all the gold bugs will tell you. And Michael just shoots holes in all their theories. So let's just start with the very first one, why I made the move. Quote where you said you were sitting on what, a $500 million melting ice cube. Why do you see it like that? Well, you know, for the last decade, I didn't pay much attention to macroeconomics. And uh, I just thought of it as we had a conservative treasury policy and we had $500 million or more. And we're going to generate 2 or 3% interest on it and we'll use it when we need it. But of course, over the past year or so, that interest rate for, went from 2 to 0. And um, then everybody woke up to the world of macroeconomics this year because we had the largest intervention of the Federal Reserve maybe in the history of the country. And uh, that drew me into a deep dive. And I started studying the expansion of the monetary supply. And I realized that for the past decade, the monetary supply has been expanding by 7%. And uh, the actual inflation rate on assets is not 2%. The inflation rate on assets is 7 to 8% if you're holding equity. And the inflation rate on a bond is 22% if you're holding a long bond. And now I realize that the estimate for the next few years has got to be 10% or more. And so when you start thinking about your cost of capital being 10% and you're holding 500 million in cash that's yielding zero, I realize my, my real yield is negative 10% at least for the next three years. And so I imagined $150 million getting burned or melted away and it made me very anxiety ridden. That's amazing. So this is just one CEO talking about one business, about what's going on, and he realizes that, hey, if I don't get off this fiat, I'm going to just lose money just sitting here. This is just one person. What do you think is going to happen over the next year, three years, 10 years, 20 years, when all the different CEOs, I mean, most of the CEOs figure it out, like, hey, I'm sitting, we're sitting on this money and we have all our investors and all our stockholders and they're going, what's going on with the business? Because we're losing money. You're losing money because of the inflation. And they're going to say, well, what's an asset that we can get into? Well, we can, I mean, they can definitely get into gold. They can definitely get into other options. But I mean, Bitcoin, the way that Sailor is talking about it here, it's like a no brainer. So I think that people will actually migrate that way. And then this next part, the question is, well, why didn't she go into gold? Because gold has been uh, the safe asset for a millennia and he answers it perfectly and this is what i think everybody should be answering when they talk about gold versus bitcoin i considered gold and then i started studying the two and then i realized that gold miners are going to produce about two percent more gold every year and then i realized that that uh there is a possibility over the next hundred years that more than two percent of gold be increased but let's just say in the best of the world for a hundred years we produce two percent more gold that means $100 million will be debased down to $12.5 million in 100 years. But on the other hand, Bitcoin is, is exponentially going to infinity stock to flow. There's never going to be more than 21 million Bitcoin. So you're really talking about at most diluting $100 million of Bitcoin by $10 million over the 100 years. And given, given the fact that Bitcoin is, is an infinitely hard asset, whereas gold can be produced by human beings, give it enough incentive. I realize that over the long term, um, Bitcoin is the harder asset than gold. Interesting. So 
he's going to get into this because I know, like, when I first saw this, I was like, okay, so you're telling me that people can just make gold? And that's not what he's saying. He's saying about mining and finding gold and things like that. So we're going to get into this, in, into the, in the weeds a little bit more about, you know, actually getting gold, mining gold, and how it can actually be hyper accelerated, I, I, I guess you might want to call it. So it's a, it's a pretty good argument because, hey, uh, there's a difference between finite and scarce. When you have a scarcity, I mean, there's just not much of it around, right? But there's some around and you can find more of it. But finite means it's finite. It's only 100, 200, 21 million. And with Bitcoin, that's it. There is no more. We're going to find some more or we're going to get more computers to make some more. It doesn't work like that. So, I mean, he's got a great point. And this is one of those things where you start to poke the holes in the gold bugs arguments. All right. So next part, they're going to talk about, and it's a pretty good question because uh, the moderator here is saying, hey, uh, I talked to a lot of gold bugs and they say that gold's going to go to 20,000 per ounce because of all the money that's going to escape from the bonds market. So uh, how is that going to work? Because if all the money's going to go to bonds, where's the money for Bitcoin? And before I go on, I just want to make mention that Stansberry Research, I'm actually going to like this one and subscribe because it's really worth it. Stansberry Research, if you don't know, uh, they're a subscription-based publisher of financial information and software serving millions of investors around the world. they got a lot of smart people, a lot of good people. Uh, Max Kaiser's there, so uh, how good can it be? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Max Kaiser's a pretty entertaining guy, but he's got a, got a lot of great uh, information here, so I would uh, highly recommend to uh, take a look at what's going on macro-wise, and they also cover a lot of things with, with cryptocurrency digital assets. So jumping back, I have to get off topic, let's talk about uh, the whole argument of gold's going to 20,000 per ounce. When the money starts leaving the bond market, which it already has, it will naturally flow into gold, and that's what will drive gold to five, ten, twenty thousand dollars an ounce. Uh, what are your thoughts on that reasoning? I don't think it's a very intellectually deep argument. For example, I, I do believe that money will flow from the market to something different. And by the way, gold would be my number two choice. But if you double the price of gold, you're going to double the incentive of miners to produce gold. And if gold goes up by a factor of ten human beings have a way of putting capital in the mining and ingenuity and they'll invent better ways to mine it. And at some point they'll melt down their jewelry or they'll find other gold. On the other hand, if Bitcoin goes up by a factor of 10, no amount of investment in Bitcoin mining can produce more Bitcoin. It's extremely hard. So the history of commodities and gold is simply the most pristine of all commodities. The history of commodities is that when the price goes up, human ingenuity and human capital produces more. And we have in front of our face the best example, which is fracking. The, the country had an oil, uh, uh, oil capacity limit, and we thought it was a problem. And when oil prices got to $100 a barrel, we invented fracking. The amount of oil produced in the United States went from 5 million barrels a day to 10 million barrels a day in five years. There's no oil crisis in America anymore. And so really anything that can be produced by people at a high enough price will be produced. So there you go. That's a great example about, um, so, so when gold bugs say, you know what, there's only so much gold in the world. That is true, but we don't know exactly how much. Nobody, and I mean nobody, can tell you exactly how much gold there actually is. We can speculate, but we have no idea what's in the ground. We could at some point find some large reserve under the ocean. I have no idea. I'm not a geologist. I don't even play one on TV. So I, I don't know exactly how much gold there is out there, but we keep finding more of it, and that's pretty amazing. So we will never find more more Bitcoin. That's just that's just the hard truth. And I know people will say, I mean, some gold bugs say, well, you can do these forks and whatever else. Yeah, well, look how good the other forks did. Have you heard of uh, Bitcoin Diamond? Have you bit, heard of Bitcoin Potato? No, because, well, first of all, Bitcoin potato doesn't work. Bitcoin diamond, nobody cares about because it doesn't even really even have any, serve any function. So uh, all these hard forks they talk about, sure, you can hard fork, but there really is nothing else like Bitcoin. That's just how it's going to be. So the next one is just like a little caveat. Uh, the moderator here says, or the interviewer says, hey, you know, we haven't found any more major uh, gold mines anymore. So that means that there's not going to be any more gold. He's like, that's not true. Given enough money and given enough wherewithal, no, no one's going to melt down their Bitcoin jewelry to sell it <laughs> at the right. price, right? And the, the key point here is if I put $100 billion into gold mining, I will produce more gold. How much more we can debate. If I put $100 billion into Bitcoin mining, I will produce no more Bitcoin. I will just produce more security, right? There, it, it's impossible 
even if you put a trillion dollars into Bitcoin mining, it's impossible to produce more than 21 million Bitcoin. All you're doing is making the network better and safer. But at a trillion dollars of gold mining, you will produce more gold. We're just going to debate about how much gold. Perfect answer. Exactly. How much is going to be produced? Don't know. But there's going to be more. Let's just be honest. So now he goes into and starts to talk about what really makes Bitcoin so great and will the central bank start to buy Bitcoin? I think they're already buying Bitcoin, but that's just my uh, personal opinion. So let's hear what we got. I think that uh, Bitcoin is digital gold, and that means it's faster. I can, I can move it a thousand places in a couple of seconds. It's stronger. I can pledge a hundred million dollars for three hours in Japan on a Saturday afternoon. Right? It's smarter. I can write a computer program that will slice it in a million pieces and do complicated things with it. It's only going to get better every year forever because it's software. And what that means is people that are, that are attracted to Apple and Amazon and Google and Facebook, because they're smarter, faster, stronger networks, they're going to be attracted to Bitcoin. Logically, that means by the way, central banks weren't buying Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google initially. It'll first be technology investors. Then it will be super high net worth individuals. It'll be private companies. It'll be public companies. It'll be the institutions that bought Apple stock. Eventually, Warren Buffett bought Apple stock, but he bought it 10 years after I bought it, right? So eventually then, and then you read about central banks today buying the NASDAQ today, right? But five years ago, central banks wouldn't have bought NASDAQ stock. So maybe maybe they'll get there, but the, it's going to be a natural adoption cycle with waves of other investors taking the asset position first. So that's like one of my things where I think about, I'm like, how far are we? How far down this rabbit hole are we? How how much time do we have before it really just becomes the big thing and it's in the public consciousness? Not just like me and you. Me and you are just here early. But I'm talking about the people when you walk down the street and go, hey, did you hear about Tron's price? Oh, yeah, it went up uh, 10%. That's what I'm talking about. So not just Bitcoin, but cryptocurrency digital assets. Like how far are we? I think that we're in with the initial investors and we're slowly getting into the big institutional investors and they're starting to get their claws into it. And I think that once we start to get more regulation, and this is not me talking, this is big money players telling me, hey, when we get more regulation, you're going to see a lot more of the institutional investors come in in droves. So we're going to talk about that in a bit with the SEC, but that's where I think we're at. And once that happens, it's game over. I mean, it's congratulations, you're a millionaire. And uh, yeah. And the next part, he's going to talk about uh, investors versus traders. And he's going to take a hard line stance. And I'm just here to tell you, you know, on my channel, I'm not a trader. I just don't have the time for it. I don't have the stomach for it. I just don't like to do it. So there's, to me, it kind of seems like there's a lot of just investors who set it and forget it. There's just a lot of people who just like to trade and they trade. And then there's a little bit in the middle. Some people like to dabble, you know, like the 80-20 rule. But um, uh, for me, I just, I just don't see it. Now here, Michael's going to say, hey, I have no respect for traders. But in all honesty, I have respect for traders because you guys and gals uh, are out there just really... <laughs> really putting it out there and uh, it's a nerve-wracking experience and if you can hey that's it but you just so you know um don't fall in that trap like i did when i first got in that the only way to make money is to day trade swing trade leverage trade um that's not the only way to make money let's just be honest uh Warren Buffett worked out pretty well for him just investing you don't see him talk about trading so this is just real quick little snippet and uh, off we go Paul, the last one I saw was, you know, it could go to a million. Uh, what kind of forecast do you hold? You know, I, I believe that the, the price of Bitcoin and the value of Bitcoin is going to go up as more people adopt it as their treasury reserve asset, as the technical utility increases, uh, as the productivity of all the people that adopt it goes up, they'll sweep their cash flows into it. And then as the inflation rates of all the fiat currencies it trades in increases, and, and I'm talking about asset inflation rates, like the 10% a year. I'm not talking about CPI inflation rates. Those four drivers are going to drive it up. At what rate? I can't, I'm not a trader. I, I don't really res, you know, respect traders, to tell you the truth. Like I'm not in the market to buy it this week, sell it next week, and buy it back the next week. I'm more in the Warren Buffett school of thought, which is you buy it, because you expect to hold it forever. Right. 
and it will go up over time. I just don't know at what rate and to what level, except obviously I believe it's extraordinarily valuable. So yeah, I don't know where it's going to go either. My price prediction is anywhere from 100000 to 250000 um, If you're Raul Paul and Mike Novogratz, you're talking a million. And then everybody's in, in, in between. Tim Draper, I think, is two fifty k as well. But uh, it will go up. And especially when people, especially the big money players, the CEOs, the big corporations figure out, hey, uh, our money's on fire. We need to do something about it. Oh, let's just put in this asset where it's quantitative hardening. No easing to do. And then lastly, and this was just a great way to talk to the people that you know about how this is going to change and how it's going to actually improve the lives of people as far as like crypto and digital assets and Ray just talks about hey Bitcoin's going to dematerialize gold on top of these other things so just take a listen our company's full of technology lovers and Bitcoin is digital gold it's a, it's it's the dematerialization of gold in the same way that Apple dematerialized your camera and Facebook dematerialized your photos and Google dematerialized your library. So it's really cool to be on the edge of the virtual wave where you're doing something that's going to be a million times better than what came before it. Perfectly said, right? Are we going to stay in a standstill? Are we going to keep using pay phones or maybe we could use our cell phone? Are we going to keep using faxes? We're we going to use the internet. Well, some people actually still use faxes, which is crazy. Are we going to put our money into gold, which is heavy, which can't be transported too easily, which is not really divisible, which isn't open source, which is not decentralized, which has a different other problems that uh, that Bitcoin can actually solve? Or are we going to use cryptocurrency digital assets? Come on. I mean, that's just only, it only to me, it only makes sense. I could be wrong. Let me know what you think in the comments section and let's move on. Next up, that was a great segment I felt. So let's uh, let's breeze through these. Vitalik Buterin updates Ethereum 2.0 roadmap. So what is going on? So the Ethereum co-founder says the leading smart contract protocol will, will rely on rollups to massively elevate the throughput of the leading smart contracts by 660,000%. Uh, that's pretty big. How's he gonna do that? Well, he says today Ethereum has 15 TPS transactions per second. If everyone moves to rollups, we will have soon 3,000 TPS. So to give you a comparison of what transaction per seconds actually mean and what uh, the different corporations can do, we've got Bitcoin at seven, <laughs> oh my God, seven. Ethereum at 20, well, 15. Dash, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash at 60, it's pretty good. PayPal, look, PayPal's 193, not too bad. Ripple, 1500, and Visa, Azabadov, 24,000. And that's just what they talk about. But in reality, I think it's a little bit lower than that. So if they can get to 3,000, then so much the better. But if we're talking about a hundred thousand TPS, then you're beating the pants off of Visa, and I'd like to see that. But he says, once phase one comes along and rollups move to ETH2 sharded chains for the data storage, we go to a theoretical max of 100,000. Eventually, phase two will come along, bring ETH2 sharded chains with native computation, which give us a thousand to five thousand. So, definitely one to watch. Hopefully, they can actually do it. Peter explains that rollups are a scaling method that enables Ethereum to keep compressed transactions on chain while delegating computations such as contract execution off chain. So it just speeds everything up in an off chain fashion. But the question that I have is with the advancement and the way that things move in this space, I mean, the roadmap from phase zero, one and two is two years. Uh, look at what just happened with DeFi in the last month. So do we really have two years to really get to that point? Look, I love Ethereum. I think it's fantastic. And I've got a pretty big amount of my uh, stash in there. But I have to hedge my bet. And I have to take a look at other smart contracts and other oracles. And one of those uh, would be like Tezos, also Cardano, also EOS. And then XRP is actually always get, actually getting into the game with the smart contract and oracles, uh, which they just announced uh, yesterday because they just got approved for a patent for Oracle. And then, of course, with the uh, Flare uh, token drop, they're getting into smart contracts. So we'll see how it goes, but uh, I don't feel like it's ever a great idea to put your eggs all in one basket. That's why I talk about Bitcoin Maximus. I think that they're a little short-sighted and they should, uh, you know, kind of take the horse binders off and see what else is out there because I don't think Bitcoin can do it all. I don't think it can do it all. Anyhow, let me know what you think in the comments section. Let's move on. So KuCoin, uh, they found the hackers. Fantastic. So what's going on? So KuCoin found the hackers and the CEO, Johnny Liu, said law enforcement are now involved in pursuing the case. So they must have some pretty... Uh, 
concrete leads. Now this was a this what if you're unfamiliar about a week ago I thought it was 150 million but they're saying it's 150 to 280 million in digital assets were hacked from the exchange. This was on September 26th and not a good day if you're KuCoin but not a bad day if you if you had actually some of your assets on there because they state if any user fund is affected by this incident it will be covered completely by KuCoin and our insurance fund. I'm sure the insurance fund is really ecstatic about paying out on that. But this was the big story because I don't think it was just about the hack and the finding. But the big story to me was what it states here. Many projects behind the hack tokens prevented the thieves from liquidating their assets where possible. Let me read that again. Many projects behind the hack tokens prevented them from liquidating. Projects like Tether, Ampleforth, Ocean Protocol, and others. I don't know what the and others is, but Ocean, Ampleforth, and Tether, they are not decentralized because if you are decentralized, you cannot do that. And what happened with the other ones that were like synthetics and Ethereum, they were blocked or blocked because this is because these tokens are sufficiently decentralized to prevent backlisting. And that's the beauty of decentralization. Good or bad, that's what happens. So when you are decentralized, you can't just stop these things. And what is good about that is that, hey, no government agency can go into Ethereum and go shut this down. Shut what down? We got nodes all over the world. So go talk to those guys and uh, good luck with that. So I think it was just an interesting article about decentralization versus centralization and what really is. And we should kind of open our eyes and see, you know, uh, all these different projects, what actually is to come. And then lastly, it's they lose the CEO. So the KuCoin is slowing reopening, slowly reopening. My question to you is if you had money on KuCoin, would you leave it on there? Would you be like, yeah, they probably got to figure it out. Or would you take it off? Me personally, I got to take it off. I, I'm not a big fan of uh, hacks, so uh, I got to take it to some place where it's a little bit safer. That's just me. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Last story. So last up, SEC Chairman Jay Clayton backs innovation in crypto, but warns of a tricky play. Before I get into this, I have to preface it with this. I've been hearing this song and dance for four years, and it has not happened. I actually did a video. It was it was called Message from 2012, and it was Roger Veer. It was fascinating because he was talking about how great Bitcoin is and how it's going to take over the world, which kind of has or is going to do but what he talked about there was like you know what that etf is right around the corner <laughs> and i had to laugh because i'm like Psh. even back then eight years ago and here we are coming up in 2021 so interesting but this is news because this is the first time the commissioner of the sec actually said hey we're open to it so what's happened here speaking of that event by the digital chamber of commerce SEC Chairman Jay Clayton opened up his views about crypto and blockchain. And surprisingly, Mr. Clayton had a positive stand while talking about the tokenized exchange traded fund or ETF. He said the regulators are open to it, meaning him. Uh, however, he passed the honest onto the crypto community to create an efficient way to tokenize the ETF product. He would be open to facilitate it if the crypto community has a strong position so interesting so he's basically saying hey i'm gonna i'm gonna give this off to you guys and if it screws up i'm gonna give it on you i don't know maybe that's not it it really falls in the sec they they are the regulators so um we'll see what happens but i was kind of thinking about this and i was like why now why is this why is the commissioner going yeah we can do this right now and i really think it comes down to what's going on in the global economy and you think you take a look at things like this where Russia, Russia is ditching the dollar. China's doing the same thing. You got other countries. I mean, North Korea is going, hey, we're going to get around all these different things using cryptocurrencies. On top of uh, Maduro, the Venezuelan president, just came out this week and said, hey, we're going to get around sanctions because we're going to use all the cryptocurrency digital assets that we can. And we're looking into our central bank to see if we can viably store cryptocurrency digital assets to get around sanctions. So when you have something like that, maybe... Because look, everybody's got a boss. Everybody's got a boss. Doesn't matter who you are. The SEC's got a boss. Or the chief of the SEC's got a boss. Uh, I got a boss. That's my wife. Uh, you got the, I mean, vice president's got a boss. Even the president's got a boss, I think. And uh, they probably sat Clayton down and said, look, we got to be on the forefront of this. And we got to make sure that we uh, maintain our lead globally as an economic superpower. And the way to do that is to move along with the times get on this etf let's make sure this actually happens that's just a theory no one told me this just how i seize it let me know you think in the comments section but moving on it is interesting to state that sec has turned on all the bitcoin etfs before but the chief did say this one of the problems that we had was we got off on the wrong foot in this innovation there was the theory 
that because it was so efficient, because it could have so much promise, we could toss aside some of those principles of responsibility and transparency. I think now three years later, four years, we're in a much better spot. And yeah, I mean, we are. Well, it's like we just talked about all the different rails that have been put in, the infrastructure, uh, the businesses that are involved, the, the big institutional players. I mean, this is not 2017. This isn't 2010. This isn't 2015. This isn't 2017 of the bull run. We've actually got more than vaporware and white papers that just promised everything and delivered nothing. So I think this is actually a good play and I expect big things. It's, but I honestly, between me and you, it's just me and you. Uh, I don't think this is going to happen. Not for a while. Just me. Cause I've heard it for so long. Lastly, uh, Mr. Clayton didn't fail to give a subtle hint that the sec won't be taking it easy. He added that when you're throwing a financial vehicle in the market, don't try to trick the regulator saying the function is payments. That's actually what we don't like. And I know he's referencing Ethereum. Really, that's what he is. I'm reading this book. It's called The Infinite Machine. And it is the history of the uh, Ethereum Foundation and how Vitalik created Ethereum, how it went through the Ethereum Mafia, how they got it to market, and how they did things. And one of the things that they did is they, in Switzerland, they hired a bunch of a, a group of lawyers. And they said, hey, how do we get this uh, approved? And they said, well, can you say that the gas is the, is the payment part? Yeah, we can do that. Well, just do that. And that's pretty much how they did it. So I think it's a different time. I think they're a little bit more savvy about what to look for. And uh, again, if it happens, fantastic. I'm just not gonna hold my breath, but let me just think of the comment section, but that's all I got for today. Lastly, random shout out days. So thanks everybody for signing up for Digital Asset News. Really appreciate it. So let me just say thanks and a shout out to Tavi Makanu. I knew I probably nailed it. Book Up Travel, Chelsea, McShane, who else we got? Jamie Watson, Crow247, Sam Vasquez, Carlos Gomez, Eric Mitko, Johnny Bitcoin, and Dreamer, as well as, hey, my man all right soft. He's been around for a while. All right, everybody. So thanks for sticking with me through the whole video. I really appreciate it. If you like these types of videos, there's going to be two more that's going to pop up on your left and right. And uh, just check those out when you got time. And uh, that's it for today. So thanks so much. See you on the next one.